last week, all over the news, everywhere, communication was, it was the revelation of the true identity of Jihadi John. And it was everywhere. He's the masked executioner that we've seen on the videotapes of the people being killed, the Westerners being killed um, by ISIS in the name of their religion. And it made me think of Saul of Tarsus. We have a, a story, a real, honest, truthful Bible story of Jihadi John that happened in the first century. Saul of Tarsus, he was Jewish. He was of the tribe of Levi. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. He had studied Jewish law from the very, very beginning of his life. He was totally steeped in the laws of Judaism, and he would prided himself in keeping those laws and making sure everybody else did too. He was well-educated. The only thing he didn't know was how to properly interpret the the prophecy written in the book of Daniel, given by the angel Gabriel to Daniel, telling him of the Messiah that would be coming. And in that prophecy, it said that the Messiah would be killed in Jerusalem prior to the time that the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. Can't you just imagine someone with a death wish, and there are those people, with ideas of grandiosity that they would go to Jerusalem and say, I'm the Messiah, and, and die. And there was enough of that going on so that when it was time for the true Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, to go to Jerusalem and be crucified in fulfillment of that prophecy, the people weren't looking for it. They didn't have the advantage of hindsight as we do looking back and seeing that, yes, Jesus was crucified before the temple was destroyed. And he fulfilled that prophecy perfectly. They were looking forward to it. So they didn't have the timeline to figure it out. But the difference between those people with a death wish going and being killed and claiming to be Messiah and the true Messiah, Jesus Christ, was that we know Jesus rose from the dead. He came back after three days. He was the true fulfillment of the prophecy. Well, Saul of Tarsus hated Christians, and he still didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. He thought, again, it was a pretender. And he was out to get everybody who was following this man because he was defending the religion, the rules, the customs. And when, w the first time we hear of him in his role of executioner is when the first recorded Christian martyr, Stephen, was stoned to death. And the people who were stoning him laid their coats at Paul's, Saul's, Saul of Tarsus, at Saul's feet. He did nothing to stop them. He didn't interfere at all. He watched it happen. But then, after, after Stephen was martyred, Saul went door to door in Jerusalem, finding people who believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And Acts 8.3 says, Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Then he was sneaky. After putting these people in prison, Saul learned who their Christian friends in Damascus were. He somehow allowed them to write letters to their Christian family and their Christian friends. He found out the identity of those people he was on his way to Damascus to arrest them when he had a very enlightening experience. 
It was a bolt of light that came down on him as he was traveling to Damascus and a voice from heaven speaking to him. Acts 22, 6, 11, this is his account, says, About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord, I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are per persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. But Saul knew who it was, and his reply was, What shall I do, Lord? I asked. The Lord said, Get up and go into Damascus. There will, you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. Saul of Tarsus, on his way to defend the Jewish religion against these Christians, had a life-changing experience as he heard the voice of Jesus of Nazareth speak to him. Saul believed that he was serving God by finding the Christians and killing them. But he was wrong. He was highly educated about the Jewish beliefs, about God. He said, under Gamaliel, I was thoroughly trained in the law of our fathers, and I was just as zealous for God as any of you. He was completely wrong because his eyes and his ears and his mind of understanding were not open to the truth. He wasn't seeking truth. He was defending his religious customs. And as such, he was way out there. A supernatural event had to take place for him to have the eyes of his understanding open, how his mind could receive the truth that Jesus of Nazareth was Jesus the Messiah is. Saul of Tarsus met the res resurrected Messiah on the road to Damascus, and he was transformed from Saul of Tarsus to Paul, who became the Apostle Paul, who wrote approximately 25% of the books in the New Testament. All of the things that we are told about grace as he tells us to, that we are saved by grace, not of ourselves, not of the works that we do, but because God loved us before the foundation of the earth, became true to him, was instilled in his heart, and he had this burning desire to share that truth with everybody. And he knew that it was not just Jews that received it, but it was the Jews and the Gentiles that the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ was for all who would believe, who are all called to this family of God. He had to rethink all of his traditions, all of his teaching, all of those things he had been born to believe and had been educated to believe. We do that too. Sometimes we just know it's right because that's what we were taught or because of our parents said so, or somebody we respected, and we accept it as truth. But it's not, because it goes against the scripture. It's very important for us to know what the scriptures say so that we can separate truth from fiction. And we all, we all have those things of fiction in our mind that we've carried with us for years. Our eyes and our ears, our spirits need to be open to the truths from God that allow us to know what he has for us, what he wants us to know, what he wants us to pass on to others. Paul went on to teach in the synagogue that Jesus is the Son of God. 
all those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? This is in Acts 9, 20 through 22. Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. Here's this executioner. It, the scripture said he was causing havoc. And now he's back in the temple teaching something totally opposite from what he had taught days before, just a short time before, when he was out trying to kill and arrest all the Christians. Now he's in trying to convince the Jews that those Christians are right. What a, what a strange transition if we look at it just in the normal way of looking at things. It's because it was God, the powerful, the one most powerful, the one that we serve, made the difference. It wasn't anything Saul set out to do. I think I will change now. And these are the steps I will take. And while that's good, to be looking for the good things that we can do and ways that we can transform ourselves, there's no way to transform ourselves from non-believer to believer unless Jesus Christ does it. And when he transforms us from non-believer to believer, that's when the change happens. The scripture we read in our Sunday school lesson this morning was that we become believers and the good works follow. It's not the works that we do that come and then we believe. believe. We need to have that straight, that we are transformed by the renewing of our minds through Jesus Christ, through his word, and then we do these things because we love him and because he's called us to do them. The changes in Saul of Tarsus were instead of per persecuting others, he began to preach that Jesus is the Messiah. The result was that Paul was persecuted by non-believing Jews. The same thing was coming against him that he was putting against the Jews before his transformation. And the Apostle Paul was martyred between the years 64 to 66 A.D. for his faith in Jesus, the Messiah. But, oh, in those years, he was a firebrand. He was a missionary. He was one who couldn't be stopped. He couldn't be shut up. He, if he was in prison, he was writing letters. He was singing praises. He was witnessing to the guards and those in prison with him. At the retreat, one of the speakers mentioned that while we have a plan for our life and we want it to go a certain way and we believe God has directed it, that when that plan takes a detour, when that plan goes a different direction, it's because God is in the plan. It's not our plan, it's his. And when things go awry for us, God doesn't just stand back and say, get it together. He's there with, you, with us, bringing it back into his plan for us and using all of the things that we go through to conform us to his image, to make that plan reality. His, Paul's story is a message of the reality of Jesus the Messiah. That supernatural experience, how many have been hit by a bolt of lightning? Two. Two. Not, that's a pretty small percentage, like 5% of us here. Who, how many have had this big spotlight from heaven shine down on us? But in each way, we have been confronted by the truth of Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And it has transformed those of us who believe and changed our lives. Paul wrote later on, If anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, I was faultless. A lot of pride there. 
The Apostle Paul's new song after the transformation in his life was, But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Christ was the transforming power, and he was the one that changed him. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish. What he considered rubbish was all those teachings of the law that he absolutely adhered to, all those teachings of a religion that did not believe in the living Christ, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. And that's Philippians 3, 4 through 9. Paul's new song was that God's grace caused him, God, to be crucified on a cross as a common criminal, to be the sacrifice for all sin, that all Jews and Gentiles may be saved from spiritual death and have eternal life through Christ Jesus. That's Paul's story. Now, there's many other stories related to that. How do you think, in your own mind, those Christians in Damascus whose families and friends and fellow believers had been imprisoned and killed because of their faith in Christ because of what Saul of Tarsus did. Now here's Paul saying, I've changed. But each one of those people who were impacted by what he had done before had something to deal with also. They needed to Forgive him? Hard to do when somebody's harmed your family. They had to receive him as a brother in Christ and make him welcome in their community. They had to decide to receive words of truth from him. This man who had just been preaching something else a few days, a few weeks beforehand and now he had made the transition and it was up for everyone else to make that transition as well and that's hard to do isn't it it is really hard to do when somebody has harmed our family and our loved ones when somebody's done something that we just don't think they need forgiveness for but it was necessary imperative that each one of those people impacted by Saul of Tarsus had transformation in their lives as well. We, none of us, we, we might not be the modern day Jihadi John, we not, might not be the first century Saul of Tarsus, we may not have done those big, big sins, but none of us were righteous before Christ came into our lives. Not one of us. And we were forgiven of all of the sins that we had committed, that we will commit, and primarily that sin of unbelief, of not accepting Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. We each had that moment where our eyes and our ears and our minds and our hearts and spirits were enlightened by the truth of Jesus Christ. And as his believers, as members of his family, we have obligations to then forgive each other and to receive each other into the family and to let God work on those things that we may not find acceptable in ourselves, but God is forgiven and we also need to forget. The new song we sing, as in the psalm that we read together this morning, the new song is praise to God, thankfulness to Jesus for what he did for us, and the song of forgiveness and acceptance to each one. God bless you.